Hey, it's Jesse, coming at you with a bonus episode of Hello Monday. We had Scott Galloway on the show this week, sharing his career advice. In our conversations, Scott's thoughts on Facebook, they really caught my attention. He's critical of the company, like, really critical. If you know me at all, you know I have written about this company since right after it launched. I've interviewed many of the major characters extensively. People like Mark Zuckerberg, Sheryl Sandberg. Now I have my own opinions about whether Facebook is objectively, as Scott says, a bad company. So I couldn't help really pressing him on this, and it took us down this rabbit hole. We talked about social media companies, how they got started, why they make decisions, and how they impact our society, our culture, our institutions. Like I said, we went down a rabbit hole. In this bonus episode, you can come along with us, and I really hope you will. Scott starts with this critique of Facebook. I think the business model of algorithms that try and find the content that creates the most engagement kind of exploits this flaw in our species where we're very tribal and the content that is most creates the most engagement is enragement. So anti-vax content creates a lot of discussion online. And I think it should get some discussion, but the algorithms on Facebook will amplify that content because they find it pisses people off. And that means more engagement, more, more Nissan ads. So I think the underlying business model leads to divisiveness and polarization. I also think the management has deployed delay and obfuscation to not answer straightforward questions around, okay, these individuals bought ads that seem to be very divisive and they paid for these ads in rubles. Did anyone think to ask who might be buying ads that damages our society in rubles? Have you looked into election interference? So to back up a second, Scott. Sure. Like the the problem you're defining, which yep. is as as I understand it, and you correct me if I'm if I'm framing it wrong, that a, a small group of people inside Facebook are making decisions about how billions of people the world over ultimately conduct their communications without clear knowledge. Um, That's a good framing. I agree with that. Right. It, it stems from a bigger problem, yep. which is the way that Facebook is governed, of course, which is that. One person makes all the decisions. In fact, even the board of directors is basically powerless in the face of Mark Zuckerberg's ability to make decisions. And that stems from the way the company was financed in its earliest days. And I would argue is is the fault of the larger community in which Facebook was born and the moment in Silicon Valley that led to the creation of companies like Facebook. I think that is an outstanding observation. So first off, you're talking about the dual class shareholder structure where basically Mark Zuckerberg doesn't make all the decisions, but he has last call on every decision. Even though he only owns, I think, about 23 or 28% of the company, he gets to make every decision. And traditionally, companies were modeled on corporate governance was modeled on American governance. And that is one shareholder, one vote. And that if more than 51% of the people who own the company decide, okay, Mark Zuckerberg should be fired because he hasn't shown an ability to manage a company in a thoughtful, civic way, he would be ousted. But what happened was, and if you go back, media companies, specifically newspapers said, what we do is so important and we should be, we don't want to be subject to the vagaries or the influence of short-term interests, i.e. shareholders, we'll create two classes of stock. This way of running a company has historical roots in other sectors. Take the New York Times. The Sulzberger family only owns about 15% of it, but they control it because their stock has more powerful voting rights. But until fairly recently, tech companies, well, they weren't really run this way. The thing that changed everything, as you're right, is that the markets decided to tolerate what was typically only in the media field with manufacturers, and then they tolerated it with Google. Google really changed everything because Sergey and Larry said, we're not going public unless we continue to control the company. And the VCs hummed and hawed and said, we're not going to be able to sell shares. And they were able to sell shares. The shares performed. And now a lot of founders that have a lot of power basically demand two classes of shares. And this is across, now this has become more the norm. So you're absolutely right. And, and, and there's a larger lesson here that I'll draw from your comment. And that is, to a certain extent, Mark and Cheryl and Google and Amazon, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're totally focused on shareholder value. You could argue that in a capitalist society, for-profit entities that are totally focused on profits are doing their job. We as the citizens aren't doing our job. When we allow dual-class shareholder companies, 
when we elect individuals who don't understand how to govern these companies or even ask the right questions, it's our fault. Well, one thing that's always been interesting to me about Facebook, from the earliest days, when anybody who worked for or with Mark talked about what Facebook was doing, it was always, well, Mark says. And what he has to say may not be immediately something that you understand, but of course he's right because he's been right about everything. And it took so long for that perception of Facebook to be shaken, both externally in the public in the public light, but internally, I think, for employees. In fact, for many, it hasn't been shaken. And that that feels really concerning to me. Yeah, I think it goes back to something deeper. So as a society becomes wealthier and more educated, its reliance on a super being and church attendance goes down. And our brain is big enough to ask very complex questions, but it's not big enough to answer them. And into that void is usually slipped a super being that we can pray to and get some answers or get some comfort from. A super what? A, a super being, you know, a God, right? Yeah, sure. And that is, okay, how does this all exist? How can my kid be in pain? And you start praying and try and get answers to the kind of unanswerable. And then as we become less, uh, depend less on a super being, the thing that has filled that void, which keeps getting bigger, our questions keep getting more complex, the thing that has filled that void is the nearest thing to sort of the mysticism or what feels like godlike power, and that is technology. And that level of fetishization and hero worship and idolatry has absolutely pivoted away from religious figures to um, tech innovators. The new Jesus Christ of our generation are Steve Jobs and Elon Musk and Jack Dorsey, because technology is just, it's, it's, it's godlike. I mean, think about, you used to pray. If, you're, if one of your kids gets sick, you, you, that's when you start praying, right? But what is a prayer? A prayer is a query into the universe, hoping there's some sort of divine intervention from some all-knowing being that sees everything that will spit back a, an answer that has some veracity. You trust Google more than any mentor, boss, friend, rabbi, coach, so the technology is sort of slipstreamed into this. And if a guy can put people on Mars and you know electrify and save the climate, we look at this person as Jesus Christ. And I don't think there's anything wrong. Everybody needs their heroes. I worry, though, that it's led to a different set of standards, that individuals can also levy pretty serious harm, can, whether it's market manipulation, whether it's delaying and obfuscating decisions or regulation to prevent teen depression, whatever it might be. Uh, but I think it's really dangerous. I think power corrupts. Generally speaking, it sounds like you love history. Generally speaking, power corrupts. The dictators always start benign. I wonder if our fetishization or our idolatry of innovators is, is leading us to, you know, leading us to bad places. Well, I think it's that paired with the disintegration of our traditional institutions and so 100%. you talked about religion, right? The fact is that we trust each other less than we ever have. And that's reflected mm -hmm. in all kinds of traditional measures. We trust religious institutions less than we ever have. We trust the government less. We trust the media less. The, the one group of institutions that we trust more instead of less is actually business. Mm -hmm. And so I think we live in a moment where people are looking to our employers to be all things, to be our leaders, to be the center of our mental and emotional health, to provide for like our vision, our view, our purpose in the world. And I wonder if we've over-rotated to a degree that will disappoint us. Our institutions are supposed to be our connective tissue. You know, government is supposed to be representative of us, right? They call them the House of Representatives. They are supposed to be us. And... Uh, I think what started in the 80s with Reagan, sort of this screed against government, you know, the government is the problem, really set us off on a dangerous path. And that is the connective tissue of our society, the, thing, the organizations that are supposed to invest long term, supposed to regulate the externalities of private companies, have been neutered. There's nothing more oppressive than a weak and feeble government. And so we have slowly but surely moved towards a more weak and oppressive society because we have totally diminished, defunded and defamed our connective tissue, which is our institutions. You're absolutely right. You know, we get the institutions we deserve. They're ours. That's supposed to be us. That's supposed to be a representative of our future and how we feel about each other. I think it's a huge problem. We've conflated liberty with selfishness, and we've decided that our institutions are the enemy. I think it's very dangerous. So to what degree is the internet the driver of this? 
there's a decent argument. Jack Dorsey will say Twitter is just the the internet. That there's nothing wrong. You know, we're just all the bad stuff on Twitter is just uh, emblematic of the internet. And some of that is true. And Facebook. I disagree with all of that. Uh, so do I. <laughs> or I disagree with some of it. I think that I, th- I so for example, CNN and CNN and Fox, uh, especially Fox, will traffic in misinformation or basically want to tickle our sensors with it. What I'll call at a minimum spin that reflects people in a bad light. So you could argue Facebook and Twitter don't do anything that CNN and uh, Fox aren't doing. As a matter of fact, a lot of the content. A lot of the kernels of the misinformation start on CNN or Fox, and then they just pour not even gasoline on it. They pour a neutron bomb on it. The reason why it's so much more dangerous with Facebook is that if you have fake video of the Speaker of the House and she appears to be drunk with this manipulated video, when Fox runs it, it's immediately seen and immediately there's a response to it and it's it's seen by maybe two or three million viewers. When it's on Facebook and it gets circulated and it comes from your mother-in-law, when it's in your feed and it goes to 200, 400, 600 million people and it's sent one-on-one from an individual, it's, it's like comparing a dumpster fire to a nuclear mushroom cloud. If you think about social technology as a a reboot of the very way that we communicate with each other and the way that authority works in that communication pattern. I think we're at the very beginning of understanding like, where it's going and how it will work. I'm just curious what your general take or understanding of social technology is. I've said publicly I love LinkedIn, and I think a big component of LinkedIn, I can say the exact same thing on Twitter and say the exact same thing on LinkedIn. When people disagree with it, they see it as an opportunity, especially anonymous bots that have decided on behalf of Tesla or crypto bulls or the GRU that I'm their enemy, and they weigh in and start trying to say very incendiary things, undermine my credibility, create a fight in my Twitter feed because because they refuse to do something that LinkedIn has done. LinkedIn has identity. Right. And if I go on LinkedIn and I say the same thing, someone might say, Scott, that doesn't make any sense, and this is why. And it is a civil engagement. It's a civil disagreement. And the joke is, the reason why LinkedIn is less toxic is everyone's hoping to eventually get a job from everyone else. <laughs> but whatever it is, identity is a very powerful thing. The reason Uber and Airbnb work is that there's identity. You wouldn't want to rent your home or get in the back of a car of someone who hadn't didn't didn't have a transparent identity such that if something goes wrong... There's accountability and you can attach to identity. Facebook and Twitter have basically said, if we enforce identity, then all of a sudden our metrics are going to look awful and we don't want to publish real metrics on our on our firm because it would, incru- it would decrease shareholder value. So they have basically said we're going to have – and they use all these bullshit excuses. Well, what about – the female journalist in Kuwait who's writing about civil rights abuses. I'm like, seriously? So, and the notion we couldn't solve that with technology and figure out a way for truly legitimate people who need the cover of anonymity to do journalism, we could figure that out. They could figure that out. I'd like to think there's some immunities. Snap, in addition to LinkedIn, Snap and Pinterest are less toxic. Roblox, uh, which is uh, if you uh, arguably a social gaming system has put in a lot of content moderation. I'd like to think I'd like to think there's a purity play here. I don't think the solutions are that hard here. I think part of the bullshit excuse is, oh, this would be impossible to moderate. No, it wouldn't. They keep talking about impossible. We're not talking about the realm of the possible. We're talking about the realm of the profitable, and that is they don't want to do it because it would make them less profitable. Well, I have two thoughts. First of all, those services that you named that are doing it right, um, they're big, but they're smaller than Facebook. Much smaller, yeah. And your problems around these things escalate when you become a larger platform. And so to what degree do we fare better as society when these platforms are smaller, period? That's an interesting point. It's not that big is bad. It's a lack of competition that is bad. If I'm the only lemonade stand in a desert, Oh, this lemonade sucks? Well, sorry, boss. <laughs> it's either that or die. And the problem with these companies is they're so big, they're effectively monopoly or duopolies. There's no incentive for them to behave better. Okay. The other piece that really caught my attention was what you had to say about real identity. And identity is so tricky. And it feels to me like, look, it's easy for you to say that as mm-hmm. a white man and somebody for whom mm-hmm. revealing the 
revealing your true identity comes with a certain privilege that perhaps you don't even notice or take for granted. In fact, I know Mm -hmm. that you do because I know you're fairly woke about these things. There are certain privileges that I would love to somehow maintain that come with an anonymity. Is there any way to do that? Look, I I don't, there's no free lunch here. Uh, I think anonymity creates this notion, it's like throwing water balloons from behind a car. That was Scott Galloway. And a special thanks to Sarah Storm, our producer, and the entire Hello Monday team for pulling together this bonus episode. I'm Jesse Hempel. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you on Monday.